Welcome to Truth For Our Time with your host, Tamara Scott. And good day. Thank you for joining us, whether you're sitting in with us on Wednesday live with Webcast One Live Studios, or perhaps you're joining in on Sunday at noon, maybe on your drive home from church, maybe you're at home listening in. Either way, we're glad you're spending your time with us, and we try our very best to give you great information oftentimes information you don't get anywhere else, or you get a very different slant to it if you do hear it. So thank you for sitting in with me. I am Tamara Scott, and you're listening to Truth For Our Time. Thankful to have Webcast One Live Studios uh, partnering with us, Mac McCoy. And if you ever want to um, have a comment about the show or perhaps come on as a sponsor, an advertiser, please contact Mac at Webcast One Live Studios. We'd love to have the support. Also, Chris Roloff and the folks at 99.3 FM that air the show on Sundays. Thank you to them as well. It's just, it's just fun to come into work at an environment um, where there's peace, where you love entering the office. It's a beautiful, God has blessed this studio with a beautiful facility, latest equipment, and it's just, it's fairly new. Oh, my producer's kind of looking at me on the latest equipment. Everything looks new to me. It's new and shiny, and it's just beautiful. And so thanks to Ryan, my producer, who makes us look good. Often when I throw him curveballs at the last minute, he catches it and send it, sends it right back out, looking fabulous. So thanks to all them. I also need to thank our sponsors out of Florida, Crave, Revive, Christians Reviving American Values Every Day, Crave, ChristiansforAmerica.com. They have partnered with us from almost the very beginning. Very thankful to have their partnership. Dr. Don Swarthout wrote a book years ago called uh, The uh, ACLU's War on America. And he just reprinted that book. And I'm going to work with them and see if we can get those available to our listeners. It's a thin read, one you'll like. It's not intimidating. One of those you'll pick up because it is so thin and read it quickly. But there's a lot of great information in bullet points for you as to the numbers that the ACLU, the costs that they have, Um, created for taxpayers when we have to pay uh, court costs when they're actually suing us on things we believe in most times. So that's just another um, opportunity we'll have for you here in the future. Today we have a great show. God honors me. And I just, I just, when he does it, I just have to step back and, and say, wow, Lord, thank you so much. The guest that he allows us to have on Dr. Karen uh, Ephraim, E-F-F-R-E-M, is joining us, and Jane Robbins from American Principles Project. We're talking about a letter that went out uh, to Congress this week, and we're going to show you how you can get involved. A lot of organizations and coalitions from across the nation were part of it. First, I have a couple of announcements I just want to make for our Iowa friends. Uh, Ryan, can you pop on and tell us how the event went last night? We talked about it the last two weeks, the event with... um, Youth for Freedom here in Iowa. How did it go? Freedom for Youth. Freedom for Youth. Yep. Yeah, Freedom for Youth. Yeah, the event went really well. Um, I got there early because I worked there part time. So we were, uh, I was kind of a greeter in the middle of the room. But there were seats for 600, and we had about 530 people there. Um, when they came in, we had the the banquet dinner, which was uh, very good. And then we had some speakers that um, were kind of um uh segmented with videos so that a speaker would get up from like one of the staff from freedom would come and talk about um what's been happening the last year and what's the vision for the future and then they would have a, like a video testimony from one of the middle schoolers or high schoolers or young adults who are in our transitions program um give their testimony or and uh, just where they've come from and where they're headed where god's bringing them and um, the glory was given all to god um, the church is the main force not freedom for for youth as an organization so i was really glad that was communicated and i like what they do because they're helping youth some of these youth without their own fault have been left on their own parents in jail or parents just not being parents and so you guys come in partner with them and you're actually as we said um, helping communities for the long haul when you can teach kids vocations excuse me when you can give them skill sets when you can help them as we've seen get into colleges this is helping our communities in rural Iowa stay uh, healthy when these kids who, who are going to stay in the community can have services they can offer back to their community members. So thank you so much for what you do there. This Thursday, uh, Night to Honor Israel. Night to Honor Israel is taking place in the Quad Cities. The Quad City Calvary Church, or Calvary Church of the Quad Cities, 4753rd Street in Moline, Illinois. 
6.30 Thursday evening, 7 p.m. the program starts. 6.30, there's a pre-program. Mark Blitz, you might recognize that name. Blood Moons, Decoding the Imminent Heavenly Signs, book he wrote. And Ariel Deporto. Ariel is responsible for all those who immigrate to Israel from around the world. So great evening there. I'll be there. I hope to see you. If you're there, please say hello. And uh, last night, oh, and then also let me jump ahead. Hillsdale College will be in town at the Gateway Hotel and Conference Center, 2100 Green Hills Drive. Gateway Hotel and Conference Center in uh, Iowa, at Iowa, near Iowa State on the, in, in Ames, uh, 2100 Green Hills Drive. For information, you need to call this number, and it's pretty easy, but you know you should always have a pencil and paper or pen and paper when you're listening to this show because we just give you power-packed information the whole hour through. 800 for ames 800 for ames or gatewayames.com. Oh, um, um, it is, I, I think that's information for the hotel, though. Here's the event. It is, it is the Hillsdale Luncheon and Program. Seminar is at 10 to 1145. Howard Kalugian, I'm not sure I'm saying his name cor- correctly, and I apologize. Na, um, he'll be talking t- to you about a guaranteed income stream to reduce taxes and defend liberty. And also Dr. Will Morrissey. Professor Emeritus of Politics will be talking about what happened to free speech. Boy, that would be interesting to hear. What happened to free speech? That is next Tuesday. Uh, 10 a.m. is the seminar. 12 to 1.30 is the luncheon. And I believe the 800 for Ames gets you your RSVP. Uh, Again, um, tell them Tamara sent you. And that evening is the Informed Choices Banquet. There are all kinds of things happening last night. Three candidates were here. I did not watch the Democratic debate Um, (laughs) to quote Huckabee last night, he said, I will have to watch it some night, sometime in the wee hours of the evening and spend three hours, dreadful hours of which I will never get back in my life. And that's probably what I'll have to do as well. Another thing that he said that made great sense to me last night, it was Jendal, Santorum and Huckabee talking, uh, the, the event was Jerusalem call and, um, giving their information on the Middle East the damaging and dangerous Iran deal that puts us in peril, not just Israel, but it certainly puts America and the world in peril as well. When you give 100 to 150 billion, with a B, dollars to Iran, who is known to be the largest state sponsor of terror. And that money comes with no restrictions. Sanctions are lifted. No Americans are allowed on the inspection teams, nor are we allowed to even know what the side deals uh, even say. Um, and the Khomeini has continued to say that Israel will not be here in 25 years and they will be um, hounded into destruction until they are gone. This is a mess. Three candidates last night spoke very eloquently on it and what is facing America. But what Huckabee said, and I want you to hear this, every Republican candidate ought to be allowed on the debate stage. He said the ones you're not hearing from are proven individuals who have been elected to office and deserve the right to be there. That's a big statement from a man who has been there all along. Carson has said something similar in a letter to me. So I am doing what I can. You should do what you can to see that, one, those polling numbers from the early states where we can see where candidates' networks are are making a difference um, are taken into account when these folks have invested their time in these communities and the voters themselves have vetted these candidates Let's see what they have to say when they've spent close-up time with these folks, and let's use those polling numbers. Or let's just put them all on the stage as they deserve to be, separate the field into two, go with two hours. I don't care, but let's give them all a fair shot to be heard by the American people. This is the highest office in the land. And there was a great quote from Donald Trump. I'm not, I don't have it in front of me last night on the Democratic debate about what we would not hear. Very interesting um, I can't find it. I don't have it in front of me. I'll bring it back after a commercial. I want to hop to our guest, Dr. Karen Ephraim. I have wanted to interview her for a while. We just had not gotten it organized and set up. And because of this letter that is coming out of her organization, uh, we get to have her on today with Jane Robbins, who will be joining a little bit later in the program. Dr. Ephraim, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor. Thank you for allowing me to get those announcements out of the way. We always want to get information in the hands of the people so they can make a difference. Give our listeners the name of your group. Um, one, the national one is Education Liberty Watch at edlibertywatch.org. 
and the other is the Florida Stop Common Core Coalition at flstopccoalition.org. Okay. And you come from education, correct? You were in education. No, ma'am. No. I actually am um, trained as a pediatrician. Ah. And um, have been doing state and federal education and child health policy work for the last 15 or 20 years. Oh, sometimes I just stumble right into it. Perfect. So I have to ask you, how how did a pediatrician get involved so heavily in education? Um, when I lived in Minnesota, I was blessed to meet some incredible people who were first starting to understand the huge federal takeover of education that happened in 1994 with Goals 2000, School to Work, and the Workforce Investment Act. And um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act rewrite in that year required all of, for the first time destroyed local education and said that you had to have statewide standards and statewide tests. And that was under, um, it was started by George H.W. Bush and then um, finished by Bill Clinton. But um, I met these incredible people who started to see the problem as not just a local problem because the standards were changed and they were outcome-based education and really awful back then, but they connected the dots to this federal interference. And one of those people was a wonderful um, mother who of five children and 23 foster children who went on to the Minnesota Senate and then to Congress. I know exactly who you're Bachman. talking about. Love Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. Her understanding on so many topics was incredible. She was never given, in my opinion, the credit she deserved for the information and knowledge she possessed. So Absolutely. Yeah. Completely uh, agree with that. <laughs> so in But that's how I got started in Minnesota and then it it went national. You know, we started working nationally. And what year was that when you started working nationally? 2003. So you've been at this for a while. So obviously I don't know the questions before I ask them. Some uh, on radio have it pretty scripted out and they know how their show's going to go. I don't do that. I'm going to ask you a question. I may or may not like the answer. Is okay. your work in, as a pediatrician, do you see the ill impact of the latest education move, Common Core, the testing on our children? Um, I am not, only, except for friends and family, practicing as a pediatrician. Okay. I, I do policy work all the time. Okay. But um, I do see the very ill um, effects of both education and some of the health policy like home visits and Head Start because it is becoming government control of our children and our families and basically telling families how they need to parent. All and right. that's very, very alarming. So there is your warning, parents. We have to go to a break here. When we come back, We'll continue more with Dr. Karen Ephraim and also Jane Robbins will be joining us. We're going to get into this letter that's headed to Congress. I think it already went to Congress possibly yesterday. We're going to go through it with you and what you need to be doing now to protect your children, our children, and our future. We'll be right back. Stay tuned with us. Tamara Scott, Truth For Our Time.
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you. Sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, I'm J. Michael McCoy, and about 20 years ago, I went to a used car salesman by the name of John Hewitt. He had a little shop over there on North 2nd Avenue called John's Auto Sales, and I bought a car. I found that experience to be one that I had never had before from a used car salesman. He was honest, he was dependable, he had integrity, and he did what he said he was going to do. Well, over the years, between my kids and grandkids, I purchased seven vehicles from John's Auto Sales. And last month, I asked him to be a sponsor. I can tell you about their huge selection. I can tell you about their years of experience. I can tell you about their honest integrity. But all I really need to tell you is that I bought seven cars, and you can trust them. John's Auto Sales, 5435 2nd Avenue, Des Moines. You need a good ride when you hit the trail. Trust the man with the cars, and he goes by the name of Big John. Big John. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to Truth for Our Time with your host, Tamara Scott. And I am here with Dr. Karen Ephraim, and I believe Jane Robbins is joining us as well. We are talking about a letter that just went to members of Congress. Karen, I believe the letter originated out of your group. Is that correct? Um, it, it did, but I had a lot of great um, collaboration with Jane Robbins and the American Principles Project and um, some great and very smart activists around the country. So give us, and, and Jane, welcome to the program. Thank you for giving time today to join us. Sure. Thank you, Tamara. I appreciate it. Jane and has been good to come on this program. It was Jane and a Dr. And, and Larry Krieger that broke the news nationally on this show about the hijacking of the APUSH, the, Amer- the Advanced Placement U.S. History Exam, being taken over in this country, and our good history diminished, and any mistakes we ever made exploited. And the work we've done on that, and the RNC resolution that Jane helped craft, and I was able to submit, and Glenn Beck recently gave credit as to um, starting the reworking of that test. We are nowhere near where we need to be. It needs a lot more work yet, but my joy is that we, we were such an obstacle in the path. We've been such a bump that they've had to stop and at least admit it and pretend to work on it. So little by little, this is how we do it. And so, Karen, you made a comment to me when we were talking off air we're hearing from Congress that they are reducing the federal role in government, in education. And just like um, we think that they're now working on the APUSH exam, maybe not the case, not as much as we want. We have to stay vigilant. You're saying even though our politicians, our presidential candidates perhaps, 
our congressional members are saying that they're reducing the role of federal government. Maybe not true? No, it's not true. Um, Jane very aptly put it as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, the the standards for something very much like them, the Common Core standards, are going to be cemented in stone in this bill. And it's really very concerning. And the testing mandates are continuing. And um, there's a move through the federal consortia as well as the other organizations that are doing the tests to do a lot of psychological screening and kind of what they call performance testing in this. And there's an expansion of early childhood. <laughs> there's just a long, long list of very fatal flaws with this bill. And Jane, what bill, what bills are we talking about? Is this, is this the, the House Student Success Act, H.R. 5, and the Senate Every Child Achieves Act, S. 1177? Yes, those are the, the two that were passed this summer by the respective bodies. Um, the Student Success Act um, is probably, of the two, it's the uh, less egregious, but it's still bad. The Senate bill is particularly bad, and that's, I guess, not surprising since it's sponsored by Lamar Alexander, who is a um, card-carrying member of the education establishment. Your listeners may remember that he was the Secretary of Education some time ago, and and he's all on board with the progressive education scheme. Um, So those are the two bills. They were passed um, by the, the House and the Senate, and now they have to go to conference committee to have the differences between the two resolved. And Senator Alexander, of course, will be on the conference committee, and he has pretty much said that he wants to to come up with something, what he considers a good bill that the president will sign. And in our view, anything that the president will sign is by definition a bad bill. Mm. And we think that it is just um, insane to be working so hard to to give him something that he will find acceptable, because if he finds it acceptable, it's bad for the country. It's bad for our kids, it's bad for our Constitution. Very good. So for for those of you who are listening who have to run, I know sometimes you are in your car and you only get to hear a portion of the show. I'm going to give you the phone number. I think I give it out almost every show. You should have it in your cell phone, in your contacts, on your refrigerator, however it is you have quick access to your phone numbers. It is 202 224 Three one two one. Thank you, Ryan. He has it pop up there so quickly anymore because we give it out so often. Two zero two 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 four three one two one. This is a switchboard. It will get you to any congressional member, U.S. senators, or your your congressional members. Um, that number gets you anywhere you need to go, no matter where you're at in the nation. We're asking you to call and and Jane. What should people say when they call that number? They should say what. They should say that they want their representative or their senator to to vote against the bill that comes out of conference committee to reauthorize the ESEA, which is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, That bill, when it comes out of conference committee, we know is going to be bad because it will be some combination of those two unacceptable bills that have come out of Congress. So so any bill that comes out of, of Congress of the conference committee to reauthorize ESEA, we want the our, our representatives to vote against it, and uh, so that we will have a chance when we get a new administration in, new leadership in, to pass a bill that is actually constitutional. And then, my friends, you must make sure that the new administration we get is one who will pay attention to the Constitution. So when you're hearing the candidates, when you're when going to these events, ask those questions, but by certainly be registered to vote and vote the candidate in that's going to pay attention. My thought last night on yesterday's Democratic debate was, let's ask any of them questions about the Constitution. Let's see what they actually know about it. Um, Dr. Ephraim, this letter has all kinds of support. Were you surprised at the large numbers and the coalitions that came in behind this letter? Um, I was excited. 
extremely gratified, but honestly, given the the broad understanding of many groups across this nation and the the genuine concern that so many people have for the hearts and minds of their kids, um, I wasn't really surprised. The letter itself is um, how many pages? Six. Okay. And the signatures, I'm telling you folks, uh, where can people go to see a copy of this letter? I've got a link of it on my Twitter. I've got a link of it on Truth For Our Time Facebook page. And I have a link of it on Stop Common Core Iowa Facebook page. I will get it on TamaraScott.com along with a link to this show if you want to send it to friends who need to hear it. TamaraScott.com. Um, you have how many different states are represented in your letter? 45. That's amazing. 45. That's consensus, folks. That is a landslide uh, uh, issue. And how many different groups, can you say? 45 states, how many different groups do you think are represented? Uh, I think I went through and counted, and there's now about 185 Close to 200. These, this is amazing. And in Iowa, we have myself. I signed on as the state director of Concerned Women for America. I could have signed on as National Committee Woman for the Republican Party. It's certainly in our platform that we want to get federal government out of education. And I could have signed on as Stop Common Core Iowa. So, um, And then Shane Vanderhart and Leslie Becker also on there um, as well. So... Uh, Again, I would invite you to take a link, uh, a link and go and visit this this letter. Um, one of you, talk to us a little bit about the data collection, number three on your letter, the first page, data collection, longitudinal data systems, massive increase in state, federal gathering of private family education, psychological data on our children without consent. Well, the the first thing that I would point out about the um, both bills is that they they reference FERPA, which is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is the federal student privacy data privacy statute that has been around for a long time and was gutted by the administration several years ago by regulation, so that it now doesn't really protect much of anything. There's uh, under the the new FERPA, you could really give personal student data to literally anyone in the world um, without parental consent or even knowledge, as long as you use the right terminology to justify it. So so these bills, by, by referencing FERPA, are essentially um, giving the stamp of approval to that gutting of that statute. So that's one problem. Another problem is that um, both bills encourage the kinds of of truly disturbing psychological data collection through the digital learning so-called personalized learning these sophisticated platforms that that essentially create psychological dossiers on students by by the um the students interaction with these uh digital learning platforms and that is what there is really no protection against FERPA of course was written before any of that was even around um so so that is a a huge concern uh, not only that the the government and the school is the government don't get that wrong um would be collecting this sort of information on students in the in the guise of of personalizing their learning but that there is practically no protection about where that kind of data would go would it go to the private company that that creates the the digital platform? Would it be sold to other people, uh, to other companies that might want to profit off of that? Would it be used by the government? Because remember, Common Core is just a completely workforce development model. It's not an education model. It's about workforce development, and it's about creating the kinds of cogs in the machine that um, that the government thinks we need to have for our managed economy. So, so, so both bills... Um, not only do they not do anything to to protect our students against it, against this, they actually encourage it. And I would add, Tamara, that the that there's at least six different ways that the federal government, through either policy or 
legislation is moving to expand, dramatically expand that psychological screening. And now they aren't even shy about it. Besides both of these bills, these um, No Child Left Behind rewrite bills, the National Assessment for Educational Progress is saying that they're going to assess mindsets and grit. Um, the there's another bill um, that governs the National Center for Education Statistics, and they're talking about doing research in education on social emotional learning. Um, there's several efforts through um, special education policy, and it's just it just goes on and on, and it's getting it's really really concerning. We have to go to a break here shortly. When we come back, I would like you ladies to discuss what this means to everyday parents and their kids. Because we hear this type of testing, we think it won't impact us. We think about school shootings, and we think certainly we need to have this type of data or screening or protective um, uh, screening so that these dangerous situations don't occur occur in our in our schools. But that's not what we're talking about here, and these will not help uh, prevent those situations. And uh, I want to get to that when we come back, and, and we might just touch on teen screen. We fought that on this show and previous networks for, for years. And when it just went away, I knew we were in trouble. I knew they had another avenue, and I believe this is it. We'll be right back with Dr. Karen Ephraim from Education Liberty Watch and Jane Robbins, American Principles Project, right after these messages. Stay tuned. It's information that impacts your kids. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wonderscheid. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us, 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about, is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're going to make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said.
Welcome back to Truth For Our Time with your host, Tamara Scott. Thank you for joining us. I am Tamara Scott, and I count it a privilege that you spend your time with us, whether it's on 99.3 FM or whether it's with our webcast, uh, onelive.com, live 10 a.m. Central Time on Wednesdays. You can get archives of the show at tamarascott.com, just to make it for easy for everyone. We've done that. Tamarascott.com. We'll have an archive available later today. Uh, I want to talk a couple different things. Uh, our, our own governor here in the state made a comment on a radio show last night that Iowa doesn't have the Common Core. I can produce a letter for you if necessary. We've done it on this show before. A letter that was sent to the SBAC, Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium, in which the governor had a one-paragraph letter that said, Iowa has the Common Core standards, which are now known as the Iowa standards. So Iowa standards are the Common Core standards, And Jane, I think you've worked through us with this. You've testified before our state legislature. I think you can probably confirm what I'm saying. Iowa is very embedded in the Common Core. So don't by any means think that this doesn't impact you. We are in it up to our eyeballs. And the testing that Karen Ephraim, Dr. Karen Ephraim from Education Liberty Watch and Jane Robbins, American Principles Project, are talking about, that data is and will be collected on your child as well right here in this state whether you know about it or not that is true and it's very very concerning and the excuse one of the other excuses besides supposed skills or um, skills testing for this you know for the workforce development is violence prevention and that is ridiculously inappropriate because even the experts admit and did so particularly after the very tragic Newtown shooting that they cannot predict someone who is known to be mentally ill, whether they will be violent or not, much less somebody that isn't known to be mentally ill. And the other big issue is that um, most or all of the school shooters where there's been information available have been on psychiatric medications already that are known to cause both suicidal and homicidal rages and outbursts. And those would be the um, the I don't, connecting indicator, I think, rather than anything else they're trying to tie these kids to, uh, f- you know, flags on websites or anything else, there is usually a common denominator of those drugs Somewhere in the history. That's what I'm hearing. Is that correct? That is absolutely true. And there's a fabulous website that has compiled all of this information. It's called SSRIStories.com. And um, it's a very valuable resource for um, getting that kind of information. Here's what people need to realize as well. When they're doing this testing, when they're doing this screening, what you and I consider indicators of alarm are not what they consider indicators of concern. Uh, We saw early in this administration when they came out and called, was it Christians or the Tea Party folks? They called uh, the Homeland Security folks, had a name for them that was very, uh, well, I would say inflammatory, but, but... uh, they were, they were the ones that they were, the Homeland Security was concerned about, not kids who show violence, not any of these other issues. And and Karen, you've touched on it. You cannot predict this. You just cannot predict it. And here's something to think about. Do you really want the federal or the state government, either one, being the one to decide who's mentally ill? What criteria do they use? Who comes up with this criteria? Who does the testing? Who decides which students are tested? This is just a incredibly dangerous area for us to even enter into, in my opinion. 
extraordinarily dangerous because this follows them for life because of these databases. Jane? Um, Yes, I just wanted to mention that um, the bills that we're concerned about in Congress to reauthorize No Child Left Behind, um, the the Senate bill has a, a section in it that is designed to create the um, community schools. I can't remember exactly the terminology that they use. This is something that the president is really big on, community schools so that the, and Karen refers to it as the Parent Replacement Act, community schools would become <laughs> the the place, the, the sort of all-encompassing center of a child's life, um, not only going to school during the day, but then having all the after-school services and and having the counseling services and mental health services and and whatever um, what family assistance services everything would be would revolve around the school um, rather than revolving around the family or the church or whatever it used to revolve around and and this is um, this is an indication of where the progressive education proponents want to go they want to make the school just the the all encompassing center of the universe for for children and for families and they'll do everything at the school and they'll they'll do the mental health testing and the counseling and all of those records will be there and as Karen said it would those records will follow the child forever and there's under under common core and under these bills there's no such thing as a clean slate under with the longitudinal data systems if you have a rough fifth grade year and you get suspended or you, you know, go see the counselor, or whatever, those records are going to be there that can be accessed for the rest of your school career, certainly. And we don't know how far they'll go, but we assume that they are not going away. They will be there forever. They will be your dossier that follows you around. And that is extraordinarily dangerous. And also in, in schools when they're they're pushing, they're, they're diminishing academic content knowledge. They don't, they're not as interested in teachers teaching academic content as they are teachers um, doing all of the social and emotional learning. Well, for one, one problem here is e- even if that were an appropriate thing for the school to be doing, which I don't believe it is, teachers aren't qualified to do that. Teachers aren't trained. They don't have education and training in psychology and in assessment and that sort of thing. Uh, the people who do have that kind of training have very strict guidelines that they uh, abide by. And, uh, and so essentially we're pushing all of that onto teachers who aren't prepared to do it. And it is just um, the, the possibilities of, of really bad outcomes here are enormous. Jane, I, we need to take that into, parents, I don't know how to warn you enough. What Jane is saying, there will be no second chance. We, you know, changing schools, these bully bills, all this other, there will be no second chance. It could impact potential scholarship. It could impact what classes you are allowed to take the next year, whether you're allowed, uh, allowed to do an advanced program or not. So your scholarships, what entries to colleges, applications, and thus into the career field. It will follow you. This is extremely dangerous. This is not a fear tactic I'm giving you. This is I'm uh, a warning. We don't, we've don't. we never had the caste system in America. This is what's made us so great. We have presidential candidates who, whose parents immigrated to this country, whose parents were bartenders, whose parents were whatever, whatever. And they were allowed to rise on their own, prove themselves to the positions where they've been elected and now are worthy to run for office. This type of monitoring, labeling, diminish, diminishing, um, and, and marginalizing students will, in my opinion, put an end to that free ability to decide who you are, what you are, when you blossom. And it will, in my opinion, put in, in essence, somewhat of a caste system. Am I wrong in that? Not at all. No. All right. Not at all. We've got to go to and break. The example I would use is Dr. Ben Carson. Exactly. And... General Colin Powell. Exactly. So we've got to go to break again, ladies. And um, I, I, I we'll come back. We'll start right on this topic. And I want to get into preschool. What does this mean for preschool? It's not just the college kids and the high school kids they're coming after. They're coming after your babies because they can't indoctrinate them quickly enough. I am Tamira Scott with Dr. Karen Ephraim, Jane Robbins. We'll be right back. Please pay attention.
From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, I'm J. Michael McCoy, and about 20 years ago, I went to a used car salesman by the name of John Hewitt. He had a little shop over there on North 2nd Avenue called John's Auto Sales, and I bought a car. I found that experience to be one that I had never had before from a used car salesman. He was honest, he was dependable, he had integrity, and he did what he said he was going to do. Well, over the years, between my kids and grandkids, I purchased seven vehicles from John's Auto Sales. And last month, I asked him to be a sponsor. I can tell you about their huge selection. I can tell you about their years of experience. I can tell you about their honest integrity. But all I really need to tell you is that I bought seven cars, and you can trust them. John's Auto Sales, 5435 2nd Avenue, Des Moines. You need a good ride when you hit the trail. Trust the man with the cars, and he goes by the name of Big John. Big John. Big John. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to Truth for Our Time with your host, Tamara Scott. I am Tamir Scott. Thank you for listening in. I'm talking with Dr. Karen Ephraim from Education Liberty Watch, Jane Robbins, American Principles Project. We're discussing a letter recently sent to Congress. The letter itself, only six pages, but another five pages accompany this letter, five pages of names from individuals with organizations in support of this letter, asking them to vote against anything coming out of the conference committee with the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind asking them to simply wait until a new administration comes in, one that will reverence the Constitution, the independence of states, and the um, 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 authority of parents. And this is an incredible bill, we, incredible need that we want them to wait to do any work or to reauthorize. And I will put on you for online for you on TamaraScott.com when I post this, I'll put, and it will be later in the day, I have to tell you. I'll put the link to Lamar Alexander's video from several years back when he was, in fact, talking about, uh, whether it was Karen or Jane, talking about the um, the full service, the community schools, where he wants kids in school so many days a week, so many hours a day, uh, 300 and, I don't know, did he say 65 days a year? He wants care facility. He wants health care coming out of there. I'll put that in there so you can tell we're not making this up. It was something he said a while ago. Karen, was it you that was going to touch on the what I had just said about this, in essence, forming a caste system in our nation? Or was that Jane? I, I'm sorry, what was the last question? Was it you or was it Karen Was it or Jane that was going to touch on my comments about us becoming a caste system through this ed, 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 education policy of labeling uh, and marginalizing kids? Well, I just mentioned that that if this system had been in place when... Dr. Ben Carson was a troubled youth growing up, you know, with a single mother in a very violent area of Detroit, or Colin Powell when he was young. Um, They never, ever would have risen to the heights that they have. And... I have been incredibly honored when I was in medical school. I actually um, was able to take care of a patient under um, Dr. Carson's teaching, and he's just an incredible man. And um, God did an amazing work in his life. And if this system had been in place then fully operational, he we never would have had his his talent and his um, dedication 
and all the thousands of lives that he saved. And he is just one example of the many individuals we have out there who blossomed after school, who found talents and gifts they've given back to the community and services, things that they fell into or found after years of failure and were able to then find uh, their ability and their gifting in another area. He's just one example of the good that came that would not be allowed through the Common Core teaching. Jane, can you touch on the preschool? They're coming after our kids ever younger. Yes. Um, all of the data systems now are, are labeled uh, P16 or P20 data um, systems. And the P stands for preschool, although in in Oregon, I think it could stand for prenatal because they're talking about the schools having some uh, tracking uh, children before they're even born. And I wish I were making that up, but I'm not. Uh, both of these bills that will come out in a conference committee into one bill, um, expand federal tentacles into preschool uh, so that the, all of the federal mandates and dictates would apply to preschool programs as well as K-12 programs because they, the, uh, the progressive education people and the workforce development people and all of the people who are in charge here instead of parents, it seems, want to start kids off just as soon as they can, get them out of the home, get them into the institutional setting, and start tracking them. And I know I attended something here in in Georgia where someone in the um, Georgia Department of Education was talking about how we had to work on our preschool standards. We had to have rigorous preschool standards to prepare children for the rigorous kindergarten that they would be going into. And I just thought we have lost our collective minds because we are now expecting three-year-olds to endure rigorous um, teaching or training, even in preschool, where you're supposed to be coloring and sliding down the sliding board. But the, the worst part of it is that the children do not stay home with their mothers and with their fathers uh, when they're little, now they're supposed to go to school every day. They're supposed to go to this community school and just get get acclimated from the earliest ages, even from infancy, to being in school and having the, the, the school take care of you and guide you and counsel you. And you look to that for everything, every aspect of your life. And this is extraordinarily dangerous, especially when there is no credible uh, actually um, well-done research that shows that preschool experiences are helpful for future education. Uh, Head Start has been studied for years, and, and it, it's just it's really undisputed that Head Start doesn't help at all, and any benefits that it gives are pretty much gone by third grade. So, of course, the government keeps pouring trillions of dollars into Head Start. Um, and, and Karen, I think, knows more about some of the, the research about the effect on children of preschool, that it can actually be harmful rather than helpful. So she might want to jump in here. And Karen, we've got maybe a minute, two left, and I want to get that action in item for folks to do. So if you can get that in there okay. quickly, thank you. Well, just really briefly, there are a whole host of studies that show academic and emotional harm, not just no effect, but harm. And the most recent one was from Senator Alexander's home state of Tennessee um, that showed um, a drop-off of academic and behavioral performance of kids that were in preschool versus ones that weren't. Very good. And that's actually referenced in the letter, so people okay. can look. So ladies, we're entering the last minute of our program. We want folks to call that 202-224-3121, which is all of your congressional members, Congress and Senate, ask them to vote against reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, wait till a new administration comes in that respects and reveres the Constitution, and Karen, you mentioned, get on Twitter and tweet to your congressional members, tweet to your Senate members publicly on social media. And I yes, will... And, and include the link. There's a, there's, um, a short link of the letter so that they can just tweet it right to there or um, put it on Facebook. And do you have that short link members. on a website? Or 
It is. It is in that press release. In the press release. Very good. And the press release, I have the link on Truth For Our Time Facebook page. Um, and I will also try to, and it's in the tweet that we put out earlier today about this show. So you can go to Truth For Our Time, tweet, Twitter, and find it on there. And I'll also try later in the day to get it on TamaraScott.com. Dr. Karen Ephraim, Education Liberty Watch, and also with the Florida Stop Common Core Coalition. Jane Robbins, American Principles Project. I thank you both for your dedication, the time that you have spent researching, digging into this, and continuing to bring it back to parents, even though uh, Congress has thwarted efforts and ignored us and given us lip service on this issue. Parents, this is your responsibility. They are your children. Stand up and advocate for their freedom. You've been encouraged. Now never be complacent.